And I want to kick off with a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is this, that uh, it's a fairly serious message, which is a a little bit out of my comfort zone. It's more serious than normal. And it's, it's focusing on a challenge or a tension that we face in relationships, any kind of relationship. You might not be facing it right now, but I can almost guarantee you somewhere down the line you will face this challenge. But before we get too serious, I, I want to share a story with you. So some of you are aware and others not that I live on a plot, a small holding. I guess I'm a plotter. Okay. <laughs> One of those South African words is just so great. So we are 20 minutes outside of town, and we've got the chickens and geese and the whole lot. Of, we really, really love it. Uh, there was my family. We, we just love the open space. We love the quiet of being out in the countryside. So it's really great. But like anything in life, it's got advantages, but it also has some disadvantages. So what are some of those disadvantages? Well, one of them is with that space, comes a lot of mowing, <laughs> a lot of mowing. So that's one. Then the other one, snakes. Yep, you don't really get them in town, but out on the plot, you're going to get snakes. And one in particular is quite prolific, the wrinkles. In fact, I've got a picture for us. It's the banded, spitting cobra. And what's quite unique about this snake is that it can bite and spit. Now, most snakes can normally only do one or the other, but this guy can do both. And added to that, his venom is both cytotoxic and neurotoxic, which means cytotoxic, that's the venom that, that it attacks the tissues and causes the blistering and the swelling. Uh, and then the neurotoxic, of course, attacks your nervous system and, and pretty much can stop you breathing. So if you don't do anything about this bite, it is definitely fatal. So I want to share a story with you what happened about 16 years ago. We were on the plot. My, my two girls, who are now teenagers, were little babies and toddlers at the time. And Noreen, my wife, was hanging up the washing on a beautiful, sunny afternoon. Megan, the, the baby, is sitting on a blanket, minding her own business. And Grace, the toddler, is doing what toddlers do, toddling off. And she's headed a couple of meters away to a step, an area of the house that we were still kind of constructing at the time, so it was quite a high step. And you know what they're like, they're adventurous, they want to go see things, so she's got both her hands on this step, and you can see the next plan of action is she's, she wants to get onto this ledge. But she doesn't see, sitting right on that ledge, on this step, is Mr. Runkles. And he's not too keen to share that step with a toddler, which is understandable, they're a lot of work, so I'm kind of with him on that one. And when I say he's not too keen, he's done exactly what that picture shown. He's raised his hood, he's flattened out, and he's swaying left and right like a Bollywood dancer, <laughs> getting ready to strike this toddler. Now, Noreen will tell you till today, she has no idea how she kind of got to grace a couple of meters away, what felt like within one stride, and grabbed grace by her dress ripped her away from that snake, ripping the dress in the process, causing a couple of bumps and bruises and scratches on Grace, as you can imagine. So you can just picture the scene. Megan is still minding her own business. She hasn't a clue what's going on. Grace is crying. Mommy's heart rate's 200 beats a minute. She's lifting this crying toddler with a couple of bashes into her hands. The snake is just slithering away, thinking he just saw an episode of The Flash. <laughs> so you say, what, what's up with all this detail? Plot life is not for sissies. It's a lot of mowing. Okay, I'm telling you, it's a lot of mowing. But what does a, what does a mom and a toddler and a snake, a wrinkles, got to do with today's message? Today's message, I'm going to give you the title, but what makes it a little bit different it, in the title, it's also your take home. Like that snake and bite and spit, this thing's combined in one. Here's the title, but it's also your take home for today. Let's put it on the screen. When you enable you disable. When you enable, you disable. And I could maybe expound on that a little bit and say, when you enable, you perhaps unintentionally or potentially or innocently disable. I want to unpack a tension or challenge that we have in our relationships sometimes. And 
whether it, sometimes it's in your marriages, sometimes as a parent, in fact, quite often as a parent, your friends or family, and, and it's not easy to manage. And this will happen to you whether you're a Christian or an atheist. It doesn't make a difference. But what's quite interesting, that I sometimes think Christians kind of manage this poorly because of our misunderstanding of this whole concept of love. So if I say to you, when you enable, you disable, you say, Mark, what does that mean? Well, let's put it in another line, a line that's a bit longer, but you've probably heard it before. You've probably said it before. Here we go. I know you're trying to help, but you're not really helping. I know you're trying to help, but, but you're not, not really helping. Your psychologists will define what I'm going to try and unpack for us this morning. They put it in a definition like this. It was also quite simple. It's doing positive things that end up supporting negative behavior or negative consequences. Key there is doing positive things. So if, if we look at this, it's doing good things that are actually bad. And of course, in our desire to love people, we do things. You get stuck in, you roll up your sleeve, you help, you care, you, you jump in or whatever you. But what I want to show, if we're looking at loving on one side and enabling on the other side, enabling, you're kind of doing something, you're getting stuck in, you're helping, you're rolling up your sleeves, but it actually is causing harm. So if we're really ruthless with ourselves, it's not really helping, it's not really caring, it's not really loving. And perhaps you're doing something for someone that can and should be doing it for themselves. But you say, aren't Christians supposed to help wherever they can? Or perhaps you're covering for someone at the moment when you shouldn't be, but you say, but Mark, I thought the Bible says, you know, we cover a multitude of sin or we should cover one another's nakedness. Or maybe you're paying a bill or doing something for someone when you should have actually said no, but you say, aren't we supposed to give as Christians? So I want to have a look at this because I think you'll agree with me, it's not that clear to sometimes see the difference between enabling and loving. Am I going to make it crystal clear for us? Probably not, but hopefully a little bit clearer if you find yourself in a situation like that today. Now, where do we start? God calls us to love people. I mean, that is Christianity 101. And I could have chosen so many verses where God instructs us to do that, or He gives us examples to do that, or He sets an example, uh, commands. I mean, it's all over hundreds. We could have gone to 1 Corinthians 13, but I'm going to choose a verse from Hebrews. It's not a very well-known verse, but Hebrews is such a deep theological a wonderful book in the New Testament, and there's a reason why I want to use this verse, we'll see in a moment. So let's pop it up on the screen, we're in chapter 13, so do not forget, forget or neglect, don't be complacent, take this seriously, to do what? Kindness and good. What does that look like? Well, be generous, distribute, contribute to the needy. I think an important line there is when we see needy, we think, oh, homeless people, poor people. No, anyone, if you think about it, anyone who has a need is needy. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So now what happens? We're going to jump a little bit backwards here because now we see a verse, okay, that's love. You can see that's a verse of love. There is distributing. There is giving. There is um, being generous. We kind of get that. But what does God say a chapter before this verse? And let's have a look now in chapter 12. But God disciplines us for our key word there, good, in order that we may share in his holiness. In other words, we become more like him. Then it goes on to say, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now, why do I want to hold these two verses together? You see, the enabler tries to stop God's discipline or pain, tries to jump in and lessen it or reduce it or try and stall it. 
Now, let's have a look. When it says no discipline is pleasant and there's pain, I think it's fair to say for all of us, when you start using the word discipline and pain, they don't fall too well on human ears. We don't like to hear that at all. We kind of think of a God with that big stick who's just waiting for us to step out of line so he can use the stick. Those are some of the crazy pictures that we get. Or sometimes we're thinking back of military when I had to run around the tree for a hundred times because we did something wrong or a teacher sent us to detention. Those are kind of the thoughts or our perception of discipline and the pain involved with that. So what I want to do is I just want to take that verse, that particular part of the verse, and I just want to rephrase it. It's going to be saying the same thing but just in a very different way, and I think it might just fall a little bit easier on our ears. So I'm going to change that verse. You say, you're not allowed to do that. The Bible says there'll be plagues and pestilence. I asked God, and he said, sure, go for it, okay? But what I'm also going to ask you is for quite a bit of leeway if you see how I'm going to change this verse to say the same thing in a different way, but falls a bit easier on our ears. So let's go and put that up. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Got that. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those being trained by it. Here's the rephrase. Uncomfortable consequences help me get my rear in gear before I really see my rear. <laughs> Remember, I did ask for leeway. <laughs> Uncomfortable consequences help me... Get my butt in gear before I really see my butt. That's translation message 1.2. You see, sometimes we're facing uncomfortable consequences because of our decisions or lack of decisions or actions or lack, lack of actions. And God allows that and has to so that we move and we make a change and we grow and we mature. But then the problem comes in. The enabler steps in and tries to prevent the uncomfortable consequences. Let me illustrate. A wife is married to a husband who's been struggling with alcohol for a long time. And it's just getting totally out of hand. And he's drinking at all hours of the day. In fact, he's passed out on the ground and not... 10 o'clock in the morning, and he's missing an important work meeting. So what does she do? Phones the work, makes up a story that he's not well, it might be COVID or whatever. After all, didn't she promise at the altar for better or for worse? Or the youngster who's been lazy and playing video games wakes up 9 o'clock in the evening with a thought, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to have a speech ready for class tomorrow, for English, a very important speech, but it's okay, mommy and daddy stay up until all hours of the night writing the speech for him, have it all ready with his breakfast for him in the morning. I mean, after all, isn't he just going through a phase? Mommy's working with a toddler, has been playing up a little bit, so removes a toy from him just to kind of teach him. Or she removes a cell phone from a teenager who hasn't been listening to the boundaries using the cell phone. But in comes daddy and like, oh, love, I think you're making a big thing out of this. Shame, man. Let's give it back to them within two minutes. So the toy, the cell phone is back in their hands. Family friend. He's got a gambling addiction. He's up to his ears in debt. Sheriff of the court arrives to take his car away. But the family, the friends, all club in to save the day, to try and cover the problem. I mean, isn't a friend in need a friend indeed? A young a youngster gets involved with the wrong crowd and gets involved with drug use and drug selling. He gets arrested, but mommy and daddy find the best lawyers that money can buy. Are we really helping? Are we really caring? Is it really loving? Or when you enable, you actually disable. Uncomfortable consequences help me get my rear in gear before I really 
see my rear. In fact, I want to go back to that verse. It is so powerful. The Hebrews writer drops one or two important clues and thoughts in that verse which make it so important. So he says the following, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. You know what is so important about that line? The pain is not just for the person experiencing it, but also those around that person. Think about it. Not just for the direct, but those indirectly also have the unpleasant, the pain. But then it says this, there's hope. Later on, however, it produces what? Such a great word. Harvest. So the writer uses this farming analogy. So firstly, later on, you don't plant a seed and then step back and say, I wonder how long is it going to take checking my watch, getting a bit impatient, like, can you hurry up? It doesn't work that way. You plant that seed, and God is highlighting something. There's always a process of time. Patience is required. But then what happens? Harvest. You spoke to a financial guru who would say to you, compound interest. The return is huge. And then it's, it unpacks what is that Return. The return is incredible. A return of righteousness. What is that? Right standing with people, right standing with God. And then it says, a return of peace. How many of you would say, oh, I'd love to have a life of peace? Yes, what an incredible harvest. See, it's highlighting a truth that is so important. This is how God, for our good, he says, this is how we're going to do it. Sometimes there's going to be short-term consequences with long-term benefits. Sometimes you're going to face short-term consequences and they're going to be unpleasant and painful, but later on there's going to be a harvest of long-term benefits. So let me go back to some of the examples, analogies. So he's drunk, he's lying on the ground, he's missing the work meeting, the wife doesn't make a call at all. In fact, the work finds out and he gets fired. Short-term consequence, because you know what happens? He gets the fright of his life, he checks himself into rehab and saves his life. The teenager wakes up 9 o'clock at night. Oh my goodness, I've got a speech to do. Mommy and daddy say, oh, good luck and go to bed. He puts together a horrible speech, fails English, short-term consequence, gets the fright of his life, rolls up his sleeve and hooks the rest of the year. Sheriff of the court comes to take the vehicle away. No family, no friends jump in to save the day. His life is a nightmare of transport for the next couple of months or couple of years, short-term consequence, but he never steps foot in a casino again, and in fact, he gets some help with his finances, long-term benefits. But when we enable, we kind of swap this around, and we target short-term benefits, which end up with long-term consequences. And that dad who comes running in every time to save the day for the toddler and give the toy back as fast as possible or give the cell phone back to the teenager and next thing down the road, they become rebellious teenagers and dysfunctional adults. Short-term benefits resulting in long-term consequences. Mommy and daddy's hotshot lawyer got, got the lighty off with his drug charges. Short-term benefits. And he overdoses a year later. Long-term consequences. And it's fair enough to say nobody enables intentionally. No one does that. Our hearts are right. We feel sorry. We're like, I've been there. Or I'm the mom. I'm the dad. Or I'm a friend. And it's terrible to see them going through this. I don't want to tear the dress. But it's just a matter of time. And the snake will strike. And God is saying, I can use these unpleasant situations or what have you for your good. And sometimes you're even involved with that. But it protects you from the wrinkles with way more unpleasantness, way more 
pain. Now, I know you're sitting there and thinking what I was thinking. How do you know? How do you know, Mark? I mean, you've, you kind of make it sound clear, but in reality, it's not that clear. It's not that clear to see the difference between loving and enabling. I, and maybe I am on the wrong side of the fence. Or maybe you're sitting there saying, I think I got it, and I think I'm doing that very thing. What, what should I be doing? How am I supposed to handle those? Those are good questions. What would I answer to that? Pray. You say, oh, you're a pastor. You're supposed to say that. Leonard just handled an incredible series on the power of prayer. We've got to click that. But I want to read to you such a beautiful, beautiful line from James, right in the beginning of James. And I want to read it to you from the message because I think it's quite funny at the same time. But look what he says. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. I mean, that just covers so many things. But would you agree that when you're sitting in a relationship or a situation where you're thinking, I'm not sure if I'm contributing to the problem or if I'm actually loving it. Lord, I don't know what to do. Pray. God loves to help. A more formal translation says, if you're lacking in wisdom, ask the Father because He loves to give wisdom generously. But I want to look at maybe one or two practical thoughts and points. If you're sitting with those two questions in your mind at the moment, like how do I know the difference or maybe I am in this and I don't know what to do. Just a couple of questions, a couple of thoughts. Are they going to be foolproof? No. But I hope that in a way they pro provide a little bit of a filter for you and I to make better decisions if we're faced with this dilemma. So the first question, in a way, is like, how do I know? Can I distinguish between, or maybe I shouldn't be involved here? All right, two words, able and cheerful. And with those two words come four questions. Here we are. Are they able? Are you able? Are they cheerful? Are you cheerful? So let, let's look at those four questions here for a second. Are they able. You see, sometimes people are in a difficult, terrible, painful situation, and they're trying their best, but they're just not able. They, they, a single mom is not meeting bills, or whatever, and she's trying her best, or a friend is being overworked, and he can't maintain his house, or uh, your husband, your wife are unable to see blind spots. But what I want to highlight, there's such a difference between unable, or able, and unwillingness. You see, a teenager that's lying around on the couch playing games and not doing his speech, that's not an unable problem, that's an unwilling problem. You've, you've been struggling in your marriage and you've been asking your husband, your wife, let's go for counseling, and he refuses point blank or she refuses, it's not an unable problem, it's an unwilling problem. And I know I'm generalizing here, so please just forgive me, but we've had one or two businessmen offer some of the individuals that the robot work Say to him, listen, join me on Monday. I've got a, a menial job for you, but it's a start. And they're like, no, they don't want to do work. They'd rather stand here and get handouts. It's not an unable problem. It's an unwilling problem. But sometimes you've got the single mom trying to bake cookies to make extra money, or that friend is painting his house late at night. There's a difference. And sometimes you need to just step back. And look at the situation and say, do I need to return the responsibility to who it belongs to? Are they able? And then this question, am I able? And I'm not saying, oh, for you it's super easy, so walk in the park. No. It may be difficult, it may be tricky, it may be a sacrifice. That's the definition of love. But I am able. See, Paul writes this beautiful line, which is a love line in Galatians. He says what? Carry each other's burdens. In this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. Fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love God, love people. That, was the, that is the law of Christ. But the key is carry you're able to carry. So maybe let me illustrate it like this. We, I want to go on holiday. So we pack a suitcase. Suitcase here it weighs 50 kilograms. Clearly my wife packed the suitcase. I can't pick it up. Look at this frame. I, 
can't carry it. But then I ask Yaku, our 20s pastor, have you seen him? He's fractionally stronger than me. <laughs> and he says, sure, Mark, I can help you. Off we go, take it to the car. But no offense to his wife, if I ask Mercia, I don't know if you've ever seen her. She's tiny, she's petite. There is no way she can pick that up. And what I'm highlighting here is we've got to be careful that we're not helping people at the expense of the responsibilities and priorities that God has given us. Because that same Paul writes to this young man he's mentoring, Timothy, and he says this line, Anyone who does not provide for the relatives and especially their own household, in other words, family, and he doesn't mince his words here, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Worse than an unbeliever. You know, just a couple of days when I was just going over my notes and looked at this verse again, I I thought of another illustration, which I think makes it even clearer. Some of you have had the privilege of flying and what happens when that aircraft is taxiing out, that cabin attendant is busy, busy doing all the displays, and there's the exits, and da, 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 da. And then if we have a problem, the face mask, and then she dangles the face mask. Now, not, some of you are looking at me like, oh, yeah, but we're busy looking at the magazine. You're not looking at that. Am I right? And then she says something rather important, by the way. She says, you know, in an unlikely event, so that you don't panic, We experience a problem or explosive decompression, which, by the way, means we're sitting at 38,000 feet where there's no oxygen, and suddenly there's some kind of hole in the aircraft, and it's chaos in here. Then I find this very funny. Then, you know, very calmly and poised, you take the mask and you pace it over, you know, check your makeup at the same time, right? But then she says this, if you're traveling with a child, first place the mask on your face before doing the child. What is the airline doing? Like, hey, this is survival of the fittest, you know? (laughs) No. They're actually highlighting an extremely loving idea there. Because they're saying, if you start faffing with the child and getting the mask on the child, the problem is you've got a couple of seconds to get this right before you both pass out, and then a couple more seconds and you're both dead. So the most loving thing to do is get the mask on yourself, make sure you're breathing so that you can help your child. So you're sitting in a situation, I don't know, a pastor or a counselor, and you're giving and giving and giving, and you've got nothing left for your own family, your own wife, your own husband. You're foolish. There's a new person in the office, and you're helping and you're helping and you're helping, and only falling behind in your own work. It's dangerous. We've sat with all the couples and it's, it's a sad story, but sometimes the, the adult kids are so dysfunctional and making shocking decisions, but mommy and daddy just keep bailing them out, and next thing, have got no more pension, can't feed themselves. The question you need to ask, can I carry this? Then this word, cheerful. Are they cheerful? Am I cheerful? You think, it's a bit of an odd word to use when you're talking about pain and discipline, Let's look at the, the first one. Are they cheerful? And again, I'm generalizing, but I know this has happened to some of you. You help, and instead of getting huge gratitude and thank you, which, would you agree, falls under the umbrella of cheerfulness, you get nothing. In fact, you bail them out and cover the credit card, and then they start complaining, yeah, but my rates and taxes are also behind. Or you turn a blind eye again to some kind of dysfunctional behavior in your marriage. You cancel the counseling appointment or whatever, and your husband doesn't even say thank you. It's like it's just expected. I've given fruit before to certain individuals on the side of the road, only to be looked at in disdain because they wanted money, not fruit. There's no cheerfulness there. Maybe that's a sign that I'm enabling. What about your cheerfulness. This is a line that we know so well from Corinthians, where Paul unpacks this and says in Corinthians, you can put it up, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves, there's the word, a cheerful giver. And ironically, Here, our emotions can possibly give us a clue as to whether we're making a wise or foolish decision. 
and you find yourself helping or getting involved and you're like feeling good about it, great. But sometimes you find yourself getting involved and you sigh and you think, not again. Or it feels like I'm being controlled or manipulated here. Maybe your emotions are giving you a warning light. Don't. You're enabling. So now maybe you're sitting and saying, I am in a problem like this. Mark, what on earth do I do? Pray. Don't forget that. But the two words I want to leave with you is walk and talk. Walk and talk. I remember Leonard sharing a couple of years ago. He was sitting with Stevie his son, and saying, Stevie, I want to give you two words that are so, so important. You find yourself in a situation that's compromising your values or you're uncomfortable about it. My boy, this is what I want you to do. Walk away. Such a powerful line. And I think the same thing applies here. Sometimes you realize, wait a minute, I'm trying to help, but I'm not helping. I'm in fact contributing to the problem. I need to step away. I need to walk away. I need to take that cell phone. I need to take that toy. And I need to walk and keep walking. We never advocate divorce as an eldership. God hates it. But there have been times, not often, thank God, but there have been times where we've sat with a couple, sat many times with a couple, sat with them separately, and try to help. And then prayerfully and carefully, we sit with one of the individuals and say, just my advice, I'm not telling you what to do, but if this is what I would do if I was you, I'd pack my bags and I'd get out of here. To the lawyers? No. No. Just separate for a while. Because you're trying and you tr- contribute, and you know what? You're actually enabling. Get out of that thing. And don't go back three days later because that's not how the harvest works. Take time. And we trust with you for an incredible harvest of righteousness in his life or righteousness in her life and a marriage you can return to with peace. I know it sounds ruthless, but there are times where you physically or relationally, emotionally, need to walk away. It's the most loving thing you can do. And then talk. And I think you know what that is. I mean, that's a preach in itself, but it's having the tough conversation. Having the tough conversation, but you and me, and I know I'm talking to myself here, we avoid those conversations like the plague. Why do we avoid them? Well, they're uncomfortable and they're uncomfortable for the person or I don't want to hurt their feelings or if we're really honest with ourselves, I'm fearful. I'm fearful. But this is what you've got to catch. If you really love someone, it is not okay to, not have, to, to, to avoid that conversation because you, you don't want to hurt them or it's uncomfortable or you're fearful. That is not okay. That is not the definition of love. It would sound absolutely crazy to a doctor treating a snake bite wound, a wrinkles wound, only to hear that mommy didn't want to tear the dress. That's why she got bitten. Didn't want to make her uncomfortable, didn't want to hurt her. It would sound even more bizarre to that doctor if he heard what played out there that this little toddler's been bitten because mommy was too scared to get involved. Sometimes we need to walk and talk. You've heard it from this stage. Wounds from a sincere, I think that's the key word in that verse, wounds from a sincere friend are better than kisses from an enemy. If you're unable, you potentially, innocently, sometimes disable. God, who is a good, good father, sometimes allows uncomfortable circumstances that you and I get moving, get our rears in gear before there is really a wrinkles on the other side. And sometimes we need to ask ourselves, am I contributing here? Am I trying to prevent what God is doing here? 
Are they able? Should I return the responsibility? Am I able? Before we're in a situation where neither of us can carry the bag. Are they cheerful? Is there a relief and a gratitude? Am I cheerful? Or maybe it's time for me to step back or at least step forward and have the tough conversation. You can ask Grace, who's now 18 years old. She doesn't remember anything from that summer afternoon. The dress is long gone. She healed very quickly from a couple of bumps and bruises. And she's happy and alive with me today. And as a dad, I need happy, alive kids to mow that lawn. <laughs> Come, let's stand. Come, let's pray together. Sure, Lord, we, we always want to work with you, Dad, never against you. And sometimes in our eagerness and lack of wisdom, we're working against you. Please show us. You see our hearts, and we want to love our family and friends, and we want the best for them. Show us. Guide us. Help us make quality decisions that we don't add to the pain down the line, which is way greater, but that we be a blessing as husbands, as wives, as friends, as uncles, as aunts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.